Thank you very much, Condi, for your kind introduction. Uh, I guess I should also thank the South African authorities for having let into the country those of us who travelled from plague-infested Europe uh, over the last few days. Uh, it's getting pretty serious over there, I can assure you. You're going to see quite a lot of this map in the course of the uh, morning. Uh, a couple of observations I wanted to make about it. One is, Doug said we're a very long-term thinker. That doesn't extend to the fact that we show Russia as the Soviet Union on the map. And the other feature of the map which has been troubling me since I saw it is that the two people who are pointing at Africa look like the, they're participating in the scramble for Africa in the 1880s, deciding as Europeans which country to keep for themselves. So uh, that will be the one moment of political incorrectness in the course of the conference. So my title is, is The Inescapable Truths of the Prevailing Investment Environment. Now, if you're a devotee of the efficient market hypothesis, you will immediately say, well, if a truth was inescapable, it would be impounded in market prices, and this presentation would have no value. But we do think there are some features of the environment at the moment which um, are very significant and will be important drivers of returns on asset classes over the next 10 years. So I'm talking about the, the decade. That frees me from having to say anything about coronavirus. Uh, all that burden will fall on Keith, who's coming as the next speaker. So I'm going to talk about some of the areas in which we at Schroders have very strong conviction about the outlook. And that's going to fall into two main areas. One is obviously, what are the economic forces that are going to drive growth and inflation? But then also, and this, this is where I think there's a difference between the next 10 years and the previous 10 years. There are a number of very significant disruptive forces, which are not necessarily negative or positive, but will, again will influence the behavior of security prices. And we've called them crosswinds as opposed to headwinds. And then I'll finish up by talking about the investment implications and give you some idea of the sorts of returns that we expect to get from the major global asset classes. So let me start by talking about the economic forces. By looking out over a long-term period, you can break growth down into two very simple components. One is demographics, the size of the labor force in each country, and the other is productivity. And demographics, I think we're at a, a tipping point in many developed economies. Because if you look at the United Nations projections for population growth over the next 30 years, uh, the population of Germany is due to fall by 5%, of Japan by 18%, of Italy by 12%, and even of China by 2%. So China's making a very rapid transition from being a fast-growing population to one that's behaving more like a maturing and aging developed economy. The one big exception to that, you'll have noticed, is the United States, where population growth estimates are roughly half a percent per annum because of the very high level of net migration net international migration into the US. So demographics is a bit of a headwind, and it becomes even more so when you think about labor forces. And this is the very well-known data on longevity, life expectancy. This goes back to the 1950s. You can see in, in every country on the chart, life expectancy has increased significantly to the point where it's now around about 80 in most developed countries. China has made the most dramatic leap forward uh, from mid-40s to a level that's not far behind Europe. Interesting, if you looked at um, South Africa in the late 50s, which was the time the green bar is struck, the life expectancy here was around about 48, and it's now gone to 63. So it was ahead of China 50 years ago and is now significantly behind China. And this process continues. Uh, these are, the again, the United Nations projections for life expectancy. So every country is aging, and that means that the, the demographic numbers I talked about are being compounded by the fact that people are aging and the labor force in many countries is shrinking more rapidly than the total population. So that's the, that's the labor force element of growth. The other element is, of course, productivity. And this has been a bit of a mystery to many economists over the last 10 years. Why has productivity growth been so poor? Um, so what we've shown in this chart is breaking GDP growth, this is the historic data for the last 10 years, down into the, the blue section, which is productivity, and the green section, which is labor force growth. So you can see in, in emerging economies, 
particularly China, very significant gains in productivity which have been behind the rapid expansion in those economies. By the standards of most post-war periods, productivity growth in the developed economies has been very disappointing. And we think it's something to do with the, the impact of the financial crisis and the constraints on credit, the constraints on the banking system, which have held back productivity growth. But that's, so that, that's the 10 years to 2018. If we then fast forward to what we think is going to happen in the next 10 years, we've actually been quite optimistic about the potential for productivity to improve. So we're, we're looking at productivity growth to return to where it was for most of the last 20 years, including the, the late 90s and early 2000s. But what really damages the growth numbers will be the labor force elements. Other than in the US, you can see the Eurozone, Japan, uh, China, um, the impact of aging labor forces starts to restrain growth. So if you then put those together, you've got an environment in which GDP growth is round about 1% to 2% in most developed economies, higher in the US and elsewhere, and significantly slower in China than it was in the past 10 years. And we're, you know, every day we're seeing China making that adjustment to a slower growth economy. And emerging markets as a whole still retain a premium level of growth, but the, but the, the absolute level is less good than it was. So that's the growth outlook. Um, the other impact on security prices, of course, will be interest rates. It goes without saying that a relatively weak outlook for growth suggests to us that there won't be significant inflation pressure over a 10-year period. Um, we, we would see inflation being, again, typically within the 2% region in developed economies. So what does that mean for interest rates? So what we've shown here is the, um, the level of real interest rates in three of the major economies. Um, in the most recent, on the right, the most recent post-financial crisis period, in the middle of the period since 1981, so since the, the Volcker initiative to suppress inflation in the United States, and then the first 80 years of the 20th century. I think it was Napoleon who said that if you want to understand how somebody thinks, uh, look at the world as it was when he or she was in their early 20s. And most of us in this room tend to associate interest rates with the 81 to 2008 period. And markets have in their mind the idea that that is the normal level of interest rates. And, you know, the word normalization has been dominating commentary and markets for the last 10 years or so. We think that's, that's unrealistic. We don't think we'll see the pressure on interest rates that were characteristic of the uh, 1981 to 2008 period. We think, judging from the sort of statements that central banks have been making, that a normal level of interest rate, real interest rates, we are plus a half percent. So that's higher than is prevailing today, particularly today when you know, yields in the US are as, uh, 1% and yields in Europe are negative. But nonetheless, we don't see there being a dramatic normalization which will upset either equity or bond markets. So that the paradigm, if you like, is the first 80 years of the 20th century, and that's the sort of level, if there is going to be normalization, that we'd expect yields to return to. So that's, that, that's if you like, the, the big picture summary. So, Things to bear in mind, adverse demographic growth, um, productivity, productivity growth improving, but still not going to be a major driver of return, limited inflationary pressure, and then real interest rates a bit higher, but not much higher. So if we then move on to what I've called disruptive forces, and the word disruptive sounds negative, but actually it's, it's, it's change rather than disruption. So the forces I'm talking about will have both positive and negative consequences. And there are four major areas I'm going to talk about. The first is market disruption. And this is something we've, we've written quite extensively about at Schroders, which is the growing importance of private finance in supporting economic growth. So what we've shown here is, is new money coming into uh, private assets, private equity, private debt, real estate, and so on um, over the last 10 years to the point where the, the new money coming in each year is about a trillion dollars. Now, the consequence of that is uh, obviously easier for companies to finance themselves by bypassing the stock market or bypassing the banking system. But from the point of view of an investor, it's also important because it means that the number of listed companies has dropped sharply. So in the US, the number of listed companies is about half what it was 
20 years ago in the late 90s. Uh, same as in the UK, and actually an even more acute drop here in South Africa, the number of listings has diminished. So what that means is that in order to capture growth in the economy, investors increasingly have to invest in private assets alongside listed. So private equity alongside listed equity or private debt alongside listed debt. And we're seeing many of the big uh, investors, many of the big asset owners making exactly that move to the point that many sovereign wealth funds now have 40% in many cases of their assets invested in private assets. So that's the first area of disruption. The second is um, technology, obviously. Uh, this is the classic uh, chart which shows the probability of different types of job uh, being automated in the next 20 years. Uh, different commentators have come up with different probabilities, but the, the pattern is generally the same, which is that any, any routine repeated job uh, is at greater risk of automation than one like, say, um, a lawyer or an architect or a doctor. So any lawyers in the room, you look pretty safe for the next 20 years. But if you're a paralegal doing some of the preparatory work for lawyers, which can be done by artificial intelligence, the risk is higher. Now, this all looks pretty negative, but I just wanted to give you one anecdote uh, as a counter to that. So everybody in this room uses spreadsheets as part of their daily work using Excel. The first spreadsheet software was developed um, in 1978, I think. It was called VisiCalc. At that point, there were, in the United States, roughly 400,000 accounting clerks employed to essentially do the work that spreadsheets now do, putting together tables of numbers. And when you change one number, you had to go through manually and change all the, the, the lower numbers in the table. Spreadsheets have wiped out those 400,000 jobs completely. But what they've also done is introduce about 600,000 new jobs at a more sophisticated level of accounting, where accountants are using the data from spreadsheets to draw conclusions for business strategy, uh, pricing, management information, and so on. So that's a great example where there is you know, huge disruption for those 400,000 people, but for the economy as a whole, it's good news. Now, there are clear areas where that there isn't a compensating good news if you're one of the three and a half million truck drivers in the US, the automation of driverless vehicles is, is a big threat and those jobs will disappear and they may find those three and a half million people may find it difficult to find other jobs. Uh, and equally, there are other areas where automation is taking whatever creativity is left out of some jobs. If you, if you look at the technology used for picking goods off the shelves, say in an Amazon warehouse, uh, it used to be that individuals could show some creativity by knowing exactly where to go uh, and taking pride in the fact that they were quicker than their uh, colleagues. Now that's all been automated. They just listen to headsets to tell them exactly where to go. So that's an example where a job has become even more routine, even more dull than it was. So technology, um, significant displacement. The other factor which I'm going to come back to in a few minutes is the consequences that those changes will have for inequality, because it's the lower skilled jobs which are at greater risk of automation than higher skilled. Um, so that, that's something that's going to exacerbate an existing problem. Now the third area is the environment. Now, I, I made this chart deliberately difficult to read because it's so depressing. Uh, this, is a, it, this is a piece of work that the United Nations does every year. It's called the Emissions Gap Report. And it basically, it charts the gap between the ambitions set out in the Paris Accord in 2016 and the actual achievement. And it shows that, that the line of the level of CO2 and CO2 in the atmosphere continues to move upwards. By contrast, if we had been following the strictures set out in Paris three years ago, it would have been start, starting to turn downwards by now. So uh, a very depressing picture. And we've actually done our own analysis on this uh, called the Climate Progress Dashboard, which you can find on the Schroeder's website, which tracks progress on climate change in a number of areas, uh, political change, finance and business, technology, and then stranded assets. And that comes up with a similar conclusion that the implied temperature rise on the basis of action taken or action not taken so far is, is more like 3.8 degrees rather than the 2 degrees, which most scientists would agree uh, is, is necessary to preserve something like similar ways of life. 
So huge levels of disruption from uh, the environment. And that's beginning to spill into politics. So London, for example, last summer was closed down for two days by, two, two weeks, sorry, by a protest group called Extinction Rebellion, um, you know, at the sharp end of, of green protests. We've seen things like um, the uh, Paris office of BlackRock was ransacked a month ago because BlackRock were felt not to be pursuing green goals as actively as should do. Uh, there was a huge protest outside the JP Morgan annual meeting in New York because JP Morgan had refused to withdraw funding in future from fossil fuels companies. So this is becoming a big deal both in politics and in business. And we've shown on the right hand side of this chart how this flows through to the governance of companies. So increasing number of shareholder resolutions to do with climate change, either with limiting greenhouse gas emissions or with developing renewable energy. And there's a really interesting one coming up in the UK at the AGM of Barclays Bank. There's a resolution that's been put down by a number of shareholders which will basically stop them lending to oil and gas companies and certainly to coal companies. So you can see the, the, the levers beginning to move in a way which will be very disruptive. Now this also again, word disruption, as I said before, sounds very negative. Um, and indeed it is in some respects. So the work that we've done suggests that if you take the, the, the value at risk, if you calculate the value at risk on the MSCI World Index, um, and that, that's, that's taking the calculation of the impact, if carbon prices rise to $100 a tonne, which is what they need to do in order to meet the Paris ambitions, that will put at risk about 15% of the value currently in, in the Global Equity Index. So a significant feature. On the other hand, as mitigation begins to move into a bigger feature of economies, there's roughly two trillion of investment spending that's necessary. And that will be in the form of developing renewable energy. It will be making electric vehicles more affordable and more efficient. It will be developing new um, healthcare solutions, new drugs to cope with the sorts of diseases that are more common as a result of climate change. So again, a huge number of investment opportunities alongside the damage that climate change is doing. So that's something that's really important to us in identifying uh, the forces driving companies. And we'll hear more about how we do it in practice from Katie after the break. The final area of disruption is political. And I've already touched on that to some extent with uh, the, the Extinction Rebellion and, and environmental demonstrations. But this is the real heart of the problem. So this is a, it's quite a famous chart. It's called the elephant chart. I guess it does look vaguely like an elephant. And it was first produced by uh, an American economist called uh, Branko Milanovic about five years ago. And the way it works is as you go from left to right, you move up deciles by income. So the poorest people are at the left-hand end, then at the at extreme right, uh, the very rich the extreme right, you've got Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, uh, and so on. And we've, what we've also done is we've stretched the scale, or what Milanovic did was stretch the scale at the extreme end to show the, the, the level of difference between the, the supremely rich, I think again of, of, of Bill Gates or Mike Bloomberg, and the merely rich. And that shows the extent to which a very small sliver of the population at the top end have captured a very high proportion, about a quarter of total income growth. If you go back to the left-hand side of the chart, uh, you've got uh, groups of people, mainly in emerging countries, who've moved from absolute poverty in many cases, dependence on subsistence farming in others, to a much more comfortable existence. So that's, the, that's people in China, India, and elsewhere. And one of the points that Milanovic makes in his book is that inequality has actually reduced between countries. In other words, the difference between the US and India is a lot less than it was 30 years ago. But then as you move to the right, you've got the squeezed, what we've called the squeezed bottom 90%. And they are mainly people in uh, the US and Europe, although there'll be many of them in South Africa as well, who haven't seen any significant growth in real incomes over the last 30 years. And they are the people who voted for Trump, who voted for Brexit, who've encouraged the growth of more extreme populist parties in many European countries. And this problem isn't going away. Uh, there hasn't really been much action anywhere to address the underlying causes 
of the problem. Uh, we think there will be in terms of more redistributive taxation. The, the other point Milanovic makes is that one of the best ways to uh, address this problem, and this will resonate here, is more investment in education, particularly primary education. So this again is, is a feature of the environment which is, is going to be significant. So let me just pause at this point and ask you a, a, another poll question. So thinking of those three areas, I've talked about climate change, industrial disruption, so changes to industries and changes to employment, and then political risk. Choose one, which is, which is the highest weight in your thinking about setting investment strategy? So please vote now. Do we have an answer? So political risks significantly higher, but also you know, broad share across the other two as well. I guess if you, if, you, if you ask this question, and I have asked this question of an audience in Europe, climate change would be way out in front of the other two. Um, e even in Asia now, climate change is beginning to be more of a feature, but you can understand why political risk uh, to this audience resonates in the way it clearly does. So let me try and, and draw this together. So these are the um, key points about disruptive forces. Geopolitical risk, I haven't talked about because Keith's going to talk about that in an innovative way of measuring it, but I have talked about technology, about the environment, about, and about politics. So let me try and move on to the, the final part of the presentation, which is what are the imp implications for us as investors and our clients as savers of all of this. So the, the first point is that looking forward from here, this is a bit of a truism, um, government bond returns will be very limited. So these are the returns that we have experienced over the last 10 years. The green bar is 10 years of so very satisfactory returns from government bonds uh, with inflation in most cases around about 2% in developed economies. We then played that forward. Uh, again, all we've done here is take the prevailing level of 10-year government bond yields and say that's the return you're going to get in the next 10 years. You can see this was done at the end of December because the US yield then was what seems like the remarkably high level of 1.9%. It's now around about 1%. So government bonds, risk-free bonds, will deliver significantly worse returns than we've experienced in the past 10 years. Now let's move on to equities. Uh, equity trends also, we think, will be limited. So again, here's the history. This is 10 years to the end of 2019. Uh, in every case, I mean, even, even Japan, the worst performing part of the world, the most disappointing in terms of growth, gave you 7% per annum return in local currency. And the US, as is well known, 15%. So very satisfactory returns from global equities, really pretty much wherever you invested. And interestingly, the emerging markets over this period uh, significantly underperformed uh, the US and even the Eurozone, despite having gone through the Eurozone crisis. Now let's again play this forward. Um, this is the next 10 years. What we've done here is we've taken the, the level of bond yields, we've added on the, an average historic equity risk premium, and then adjusted it for valuation. So we've used the long-term CAPE uh, measure to adjust for valuation. And that shows that in every case, except for emerging markets, returns are going to be lower. They're still positive. They're still, in, in a historical context, long historical context, more than satisfactory. But we think that the, the days of double-digit returns from equities over a long period belong to the past decade and not to the future decade. In terms of relativities, um, the US still scores pretty well, and that comes back to the points I made right at the beginning about the much more favorable demographics in the US than elsewhere. So you can see the Eurozone, Japan, also, they, they suffer conversely from much less favorable demographics. Then we think emerging markets, which are on average are cheaper than developed markets, despite lower growth rates in China, will deliver premium returns over the next 10 years. 
So I want to ask you one last polling question on these numbers. So thinking about the, the US projection, 6% per annum, let's move on to the next slide. Do you think our, let's focus on the US only, do you think our expectations as I've just revealed them for the next 10 years are A, too high, B, about right, or C, too low? So once again, please vote. Yeah, well, that's very comforting, or perhaps not. Perhaps there's too much consensus in the room. Um, I mean, there are, I know there are a few, there are a few um, managers out there who have got a much more apocalyptic view of the world than we do and are th forecasting negative returns over the next 10 years, but we, we still think there's enough growth and enough change around to drive returns of around about 6%. One other feature of this, though, is that if you ask a broad swathe of individual investors, you uncover a lot of investor complacency. So we do a survey once a year, uh, it covers about 25,000 people across, I think, 22 countries, and we ask them, what do you expect to get from your savings portfolio over a five-year period? And expectations have consistently been too high. So this is the 2019 survey, and that shows that uh, we've shown here South Africa, South African investors on the left and global on the right. That shows that uh, more than 46% uh, of investors in South Africa think returns will be 10% plus. And bear in mind, this is, a, this is a diversified investment portfolio across both equities and bonds. So it's not just equity returns. And South African returns are higher because they, people are thinking, obviously, in RAND terms, so the starting point and risk-free is also higher. But globally, exactly the same pattern emerges, that uh, individual investors are anchored on the expectation of the last 10 years rather than thinking through the implications for the next 10 years. So that's, you know, I'm glad to see that uh, you in this room are not anchored by that same comfort about the past, but it's something where we all have to be very careful in managing expectations for the future. So let me just sum up um, in the last couple of minutes. Here are some of the key takeaways. Low interest rates for longer. We think index returns will disappoint expectations, but will we'll be moderate. as returns on indices drop, then the importance of being able to add value as an active manager becomes more impor important. If you're looking at a 4% return in the Eurozone, being able to do 1% or 2% more than that as an active manager becomes more valuable. We think in managing portfolios, having an eye to what the disruptive risks are is really important, both on the upside and on the downside. Uh, diversification is going to be really important. And the final point is that how returns are achieved and the pressures on asset owners to address issues like inequality, technology dis disruption, and the environment are becoming greater all the time. So more focus from end clients on how the returns are achieved in the future. If you'll permit me just one minute of promotion of how we at Schroders are addressing all this, uh, the first point, and again, Katie will come back to this, is that we're integrating ESG considerations into everything we do by the end of 2020. So every, every investment decision will have a, an ESG lens within it. Uh, we're also making greater use of alternative data. Those of, us, those of you who came to this event last year might remember our head of data, Mark Ainsworth, presenting on some of the tools that we use, and that becomes more important. And then a, a, a robust investment platform. So uh, we think that we're in as good a position as anyone to address the challenges I've addressed, um, but I'm happy to take any questions from you now as my time is up. Thank you very much.